I have one verse of scripture that I want to read to you, and uh, I want you to stand and help me read it. Just one. Very unusual for us. I usually preach a passage, but this is just a very short passage this morning on Easter. They're going to put it up on the screen. It is Romans chapter 6 and verse number 4. Just one verse. And let's read it together. If you're someone who comes all the time, you know what we do. If you're here for the first time, this is for you too. Just as it's written, let's read it together beginning right now. Therefore, we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. Would you bow your heads for prayer? Father, today we thank you. Um, We thank you for everything that you did beginning at the foundation of the world to bring us to this place, Lord, you knowing in your foreknowledge ahead of time, you knew everything. And Jesus Christ, our Savior, was slain uh, before the foundation of the world, as it were. It was a plan that you kept, but Lord, it wasn't that he was just slain for our sins, but that you raised him from the dead, and he is alive today. And oh, what a cornerstone, foundation, and keystone of our hope. Today we are here, and the reason we are gathered, and the reason we have hope is because Jesus didn't just live an exemplary life. Jesus died and rose again, and he put an exclamation point on his entire life. Thank you, Father, for the resurrection. Thank you, Jesus, for the sacrifice. And help us today as we honor you and as we inform others concerning this most validated truth of the resurrection of Jesus. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Would you be seated? So, welcome to Grace. Welcome to Easter morning gathering. Without doubt, I'm sure that this is the highest attendance in the church the world over every year at Easter. It's because it's so very significant. I know that's been the case here at Grace Church from the beginning since 1979. We assemble, we gather, we convene a meeting every Easter. In fact, We do more than that. We gather, we assemble, we convene a meeting every single Sunday for the very same reason, because we meet in recognition that He is alive. And we're happy everyone is here on this special day, but we would like you to know that we gather like clockwork every week, and you're invited. Someone might be thinking, Pastor Phil, you're overworking the word gathering. Well, I'm going to really hammer that one this morning, the gather, and I'm going to talk about why we gather, and we're going to continue to do it. Uh, Why do we gather? Why the congregation? Why the regular assembly of people at churches on Sundays all around the world? Why does it happen? Why hasn't it died out? I mean, this has been going on for 2,000 years. Why doesn't it seem to be waning? Well, I assure you that it will never never die out completely. Now, there may be all kinds of of opposition. Uh, It may have to hide in basements, in caves, in forests, and it may have to do everything it can to avoid persecutions, but it will never die out because Jesus himself promised, speaking to Peter in Matthew 16, 18, I say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevent, prevail, or stop it in any way. You know, John the Baptist had a following. He had disciples, and there were many of them. But when he died, his following died out, and those that were followers of John, most of all, mostly followed Christ, and it should have been that way. John had a gruesome death being beheaded, and his head, because of the behest and the the, the request of Herodias, King Herod's wife, his head was removed from his body and brought in on a platter. I can imagine the mourning and the sorrow among his disciples that accompanied that horrible event. Matthew 14, 12 tells about the end of the matter. His disciples came and took the body away, and they buried it, and they went and told Jesus. And that's the last we hear of the death of John the Baptist. No one is gathering today in the name of John the Baptist to remember his death. There were many, many great funerals and observations of great lives recording in the scripture, recorded in the Scripture like Sarah and Abraham and Rachel and Jacob and Joseph and many more. Jacob's, perhaps, was the most noteworthy because it lasted up to 40 days. But no one is gathering today regularly to commemorate or celebrate neither their lives nor their deaths. 
And we can mention other figures from world history. We can talk about czars and dictators and military leaders, presidents, great scientists, great inventors, and great philanthropists. Whomever you want to name, they all have one thing in common. Their life and their death are well documented, footnoted, and not celebrated regularly. I know somebody's going to mention people like Muhammad, Confucius, Joseph Smith, or Charles Taze Russell. Uh, they began false religions, but I have a question. Tell me, when, when do they gather to remember and commemorate their life, birth, and so on? They don't. Their religions go on, false though they be, they don't celebrate their founder. We could talk about all kinds of gatherings, and there are many, many in the world today. In fact, one of the big ones that's competition, it seems, in America are sporting activities, and they bring great, great crowds together. There's political rallies. There's concerts, of course, that draw incredible crowds of people. Uh, they do that for a while. They can't do it in the same place continuously. I wouldn't know who this is, to be honest with you, were it not for NFL football and for the Super Bowl. But I have heard that masses of people go and listen to Taylor Swift sing. Okay, I have a question for you. Do you think Taylor Swift could draw a crowd in the very same venue 52 weeks a year, year after year, and carry on for decades and decades, 100 years, 2,000 years? Of course not. Nobody can but do you know what's happening world over today? People are gathered just like this all over the world because something happened outside Jerusalem at about 33 AD that we're just never going to forget and get over. A man who was crucified, who claimed to be God, was put in a tomb, and after three days, he came out of the tomb, and he's alive. And that changes everything. Okay, where are we going? I want to make a statement that clarifies why we gather not just once a year, but every Sunday, every year we gather. Because it was predicted by Old Testament prophets and by Jesus himself that Jesus would die for our sins according to the scripture, but that he would not stay dead. We gather because the good news of the gospel, especially because Jesus rose from the dead just as he said he would. The resurrection of Jesus Christ changed everything and we cannot talk about it enough. We, when we get it told well to one generation, we start all over and we tell it to the next. Let me give you a few thoughts this morning to encourage your heart and perhaps draw you to the cross of Christ and to the empty tomb. We gather, first of all, because Jesus died and rose to life again, and the reign and rule of death ended. Because the verse says, as Christ was raised from the dead. The first thing that does is fulfill prophecy. In the Old Testament, the psalmist David, King David, said, I have set the Lord always before me because he is at my right hand and I shall not be moved. Therefore, my heart is glad, my glory rejoices, my flesh also will rest in hope. For you will not leave my soul in the grave, nor will you allow your Holy One to see corruption. That's the passage that was quoted on the day of Pentecost, speaking of the resurrection of Jesus. And so Peter preached about it. Job, perhaps the man who suffered more on earth, more than any other person but Christ. It says, he said in Job 19, I know that my Redeemer lives and he shall stand on the earth at the last day. And after my skin is destroyed, I know that in my flesh I shall see my God. Amazing. One of the oldest books in the Bible. And he's already talking about, I know that my Redeemer lives. And folks, I just want you to know today, he lives. And I'm a witness. New Testament. Jesus' own predictions. This is amazing. Jesus said something like this several times. And I'll only read one of them. In Mark, he said, behold, we're going to go up to Jerusalem. He's speaking to the 12 and to that little group that was in his entourage that went with him. We're going up to Jerusalem. The Son of Man, speaking of himself, is going to be betrayed to the chief priest, to the scribes. They will condemn him to death. They will deliver him to the Gentiles. They will mock him and scourge him and spit on him and kill him. And the third day, he will rise Again, make no mistake about it. Jesus said, we're going to Jerusalem. They're going to kill me in a horrible way. They're going to mock and scourge and laugh at me. And they're going to put me in a tomb. But I'm going to rise again on the third day. Amen. And folks, he did that. 
he rose again on the third day. You know, they used to think it was a big deal for Babe Ruth to point to the deck of the garden or Boston Garden or Yankee Stadium and stand up there and say, I'm going to hit the next pitch that way. And he would do it from time to time. They thought that was a big deal. Well, listen to this. There's a man who lived 33 years of perfect life and never sinned, and he was treated horribly. He was crucified mercilessly. He was put in a tomb, but he had said something. I am going to come out of the grave on the third day, and he did it. And there's an empty grave in Palestine today, and we rejoice. Here's what Revelation 1.17 said to the last witness that ever saw him. He said, John did on the Isle of Patmos. Jesus said, look, don't be afraid. I know you're all afraid of the things that are happening in the world, but don't be afraid. I'm the first and the last. I am he who lives and was dead. And behold, I am alive forevermore. And I have the keys of hell and of death. And Jesus has the keys. He's the door. He's the way. He's the truth. Wonderfully, the Bible says in Hebrews chapter 2, verse 14, it says that when we, that which held us in fear all of our days, he eliminated. What was it? Death. He eliminated the power of death in our life. And I just want to tell you, that's what this is about. We're gathering because death doesn't win. We're gathering because Jesus rose again. Listen, I don't care what else Jesus said or did in his life. It doesn't matter any of the other events of his life if he stayed in that tomb having said he was going to come out. But he didn't. He put the exclamation point on his life by rising from the dead. Well, there were a lot of people that testified of this. Early on Sunday morning, early in April, Mary Magdalene was near the sepulcher in Jerusalem and she saw him. The women then returning from the sepulcher, other women saw him. Peter, near Jerusalem the same day, saw him. Two disciples going to Emmaus that day saw him. That evening at Jerusalem, all of the apostles were present except Thomas, the 11, saw him. And then, or the, or the 10. And then Sunday evening, that same day at Jerusalem, all of the apostles were present, but especially to, to Thomas, he showed himself. Toward the end of the month, seven disciples went fishing on the Sea of Galilee, and Jesus showed himself to them. Then 11 disciples were on a mountain in Galilee, and he showed himself to them. Over 500 disciples at once, perhaps congregating on Mount Tabor, 500 people saw him alive. The nail prints in his hand, the scars in his feet. He was like, let me ask you a question. How many witnesses does it take to establish the fact that Jesus rose from the dead, but it's not done yet? James, his own brother, who was not a believer until this point, saw him. In 1 Corinthians 15, 7, said he did. The apostles and probably others during 40 days prior to his ascension, they saw him. At the Mount of Olives near Bethany, at his ascension, they saw him. After his ascension... He appeared to Stephen the martyr, and he stood up for him as he was being stoned. To Saul, he appeared on the road to Damascus. And then last of all, as I said a moment ago, he appeared to John on the Isle of Patmos. How do we know he's alive? Well, there's an empty grave, and then second of all, there, is tons of, there are tons of witnesses. He's alive. Now, I've got another witness for you, and I wonder if you have the witness today. The Bible says... Those who have the Spirit of God are the children of God. And I just wonder, is there an internal witness in your life? You have received Jesus as your Savior. You're a believer in Him. And on the inside of you, there is a witness that says, this is true. How many of you are believers? And the witness of the Spirit says, yes, this is true. He's alive. Would you raise your hand? Amen. He is alive. The growth of the gospel proclamation throughout His church announces that he is alive. From the day of Pentecost through the first century, the church grew from a handful in the upper room to reaching, as, for, as Colossians 1, 6 says, to the whole known world of that time. And then from the first century and through many pogroms and many persecutions and many doctrinal trials, the gospel has gone around the globe. Yes, there are places today where political or religious regimes fight the gospel and they try to keep it out. But I want you to know something. <laughs> 2 Timothy 2.9 says this, that even if you put God's messengers in prison, even if you lock them up and put his messengers in prison, uh, 2 Timothy 2.9 says that the word of God is not chained. You can't put the Bible in prison. The Word of God, the gospel of Jesus Christ, you cannot stop it. You know, you can put a gag order on the church, but you cannot stop the gospel of Jesus Christ from going forward in the world. There's a second thought I have for you here. Why do we gather? We're talking about why we gather. Well, we gather because we died and were buried with him, and the slave of sin 
died. We're reading that verse now. We've talked about it already. We read it at the beginning. We are buried with him through baptism into death. Just as Jesus Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we should walk in newness of life. We gathered because we died and were buried. The slave of sin died. We were buried with him through baptism. It's very fortunate that we observed uh, believers' baptism today at church because it's a beautiful, beautiful picture of this whole story. Um, it, it preaches a sermon without words. We love the stories and the testimonies. They're wonderful. That's wonderful. But do you know, even if they don't say a word, the very, the very ordinance of baptism preaches a silent sermon because what does it do? The person standing there is saying that I believe in and identify with Jesus who died and was buried and rose again. Again. And I have died with Christ. I have been buried and I am rising again to walk in newness of life. And so the very baptism that we, that we always do shows this story. And by the way, that is why we insist on doing baptism the Bible way here at Grace Church by immersion. Because you can in a teacup and by sprinkling, you just can't show the death and the burial and the resurrection of Christ, which is what immersion does. And so we gather because we died and were buried. You see, we were already dead. We were dead while we were alive. We were born dead in sin. You say, well, that doesn't make sense. We're born, but we come to life. No, you come alive physically, but you're born with a dead spirit from the moment that you were born. Romans 5 says in verse 12, through one man, Adam, sin came into the world and death through sin. And therefore death spread and is a contagion for all men because all sinned. We were spiritually dead and we had no relationship to God, no life at all. Ephesians 2, 1 says we were dead in our trespasses, that is, we go too far. Our sins, we miss the mark. Uh, we are sinners and we are dead in that situation. We couldn't even hear anything God's trying to say to us until he gave us the ability to hear it because we're dead. Then we were crucified and buried with him. We are dead, we're dead in sin, and then we are crucified and buried with him. Let me back up and say a word about that sin just for a moment. We are sin, uh, we are dead because of our sin, and we are dead in our sins. You say, well, isn't that the same thing? No, there is an original sin that is dealt to every single person because we were born into the human race and we inherited it from, uh, we inherited it from our earthly father, Adam, and from his wife, Eve. They sinned, and it's a contagion that has rampaged humanity ever since then. We inherited the sin nature, and therefore we are sinners at the root, but that sin at the root always bears fruit. And because of that, we also are full of sins. And Jesus, Jesus died for our sin at the root, and he died for our sins that are the fruit of the root that is in us. That sounds like a lot of gobbledygook, but I'm just telling you, there's more to it than what you, meet, than what you think about. We can't help but sin because at the root, we're sinners. We were dead. We were dead in our sins. We were crucified and buried with him. When Jesus died on the cross, he was dying for my sin. The deep-rooted nature of it. And he died for my sins. So God brought me and my sins to the cross. And there with Jesus, this dead, wicked, sinning culprit was crucified with Christ you say, how did God do that? God could do anything he wants to, and he says it's true, and I believe it. He took my sins to the cross. He took my failures to the cross. He took my lack to the cross. He took my lack of performance and honesty and lying and stealing. He took it all. He took the root, and he took the fruit, and he took it to the cross, and he says, I'm placing it all right here, right now, on my son, Jesus. And then he was buried with Christ. There's nothing else to do with the old dead me than to bury it. And folks, just like you can't dress up a corpse to look alive, you can't make spiritually dead men act right. You can turn over all the new leaves you want to in life. You're never going to do the right thing. You're never going to be right at the root. You're never going to have righteous fruit because you're dead at the heart. Who has died and been buried? I have. 
We also died to something else. We died to the enslaving dominion of sin. Romans 6, 6 says, we know this, that our old man, that is who I used to be, was crucified with Christ. That the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. Slaves of sin. Slaves to the old habits. Slaves to the person I used to be. I'm dead to the dominating effect of my sin nature today. I'm dead to the world, the flesh, and the devil. I'm dead to drunkenness and dead to sexual perversions and indulgences. I'm dead to sin slavery. I'm dead to hatred and anger, envy and jealousy and pride. I'm dead to it because the guy who loved and practiced that died at the cross with Jesus and was buried. And because of my faith in him, I've raised, to be, raised up to be a different person. We gather to celebrate the death of who we were and the dismissal of our old masters and the flesh and the devil. Why do we gather? We gather also because we rose to a new life. This is beautiful. A new person began to live. You know, I may not ever be everything that God might have planned for me to be, but I can tell you this morning, I am nowhere near the person I would have been had not Christ come and saved me and made me his own. Can anybody give an amen to that? Oh, it's so important. We gather because we rose to a new life and a new person began to live. We should walk in newness of life. Look at that. There's a reason that we say that when we do, when we baptize someone. We are buried with him in baptism, in the likeness of his death. And we are raised to walk in newness of life, in the likeness of his resurrection. What are we doing? Well, we're living free of our obligation to our old master and our old nature. We don't have to let sin or the sinful master rule in our mortal body anymore. But we can present ourselves to God being alive from the dead and our members, are, that is all of there is to us as instruments of righteousness to God. Why? Because sin shall not, will not have dominion over you because we are under new management. There's a lot of bullying goes on at the schools today. I hear about it all the time. You hear about it, the bully, the bully, the bully, the bully. I just want you to know there's never been a bigger bully than the world, the flesh, and the devil in your life. Pushed you around your whole life. I just want you to know when you are crucified with Christ, buried with him, buried with him in the baptism of his death, and you are raised to walk in newness of life, the bully can't bully you anymore. You do not, you're not obligated. You, when the devil comes after you and tries to make you, tempt you, you don't have to yield. You have the ability to say no. Draw near to God. He'll draw near to you. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Oh, it's so important. We're living free from the obligation to our old master. We're living free from our old habits. And the old habits that kept calling to us, no matter what they were, they're just toothless tigers. Romans 6 says in the same passage, we're told to consider ourselves, reckon ourselves, or consider it to be so. Ourselves dead to the call of sinful habits, but alive in Christ Jesus. You know, you can push a corpse around. You can even push a person around who doesn't take a stand. But folks, we, be, we have come alive and we do not have to let sin and habits push us around anymore. I, I'm seeing Sean. Sean, you had a son got baptized this morning. It was because of your changed life that your son saw it. And he gave testimony that he believed it because of the change in you. I have a question. Are you letting the old life push you around or has God given you the ability to say no? Say no. You're a different person than you were before. You see, this is evidence. It's evidence that God puts to death the old person, raises us up to be new people, and we can live new lives because we have come alive. And then I got one more thing to say to you, and we're done. We gather because we will rise again ourselves, literally. Jesus is alive, and Jesus is coming. It says, we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection. Folks, because he lives, we will live. Now, if we died with Christ, we believe that we also shall live with him, Romans 6, 8. And then 2 Timothy 2, 11, it's a faithful saying, for if we died with him, we shall also live with him. And then right from the lips of Jesus, from his own lips, John 14, because I live, you will live also, the old song, I guess it's a Gaither song, because he lives, I can face tomorrow. How biblical and how full of truth. He lives so we can live. And then because he rose, 
we will rise from the dead. I am just about worn out on funerals. Over uh, the last few years, I, I was just looking back when I first came back from Peru back in uh, 2001, two, three, four. I might have two funerals in a year, three funerals on another year, but in the years 2019, 2020, 2022, 2023, and even this year already, it's multiple. One year I had 11 funerals, and I, I'm not the only one doing funerals. It's not that I don't want to be there to comfort, that I don't want to be there to encourage, that I don't want to be there to say the right thing, to weep with and mourn with those people that have lost somebody. That's not the point. The point is that there's just not anything nice about death. I hear people say all the time, well, you know, death is just part of life. Poppycock. Death has nothing to do with life. Death is a consequence of sin. Do you want to say that's what we want? No, no. The Bible says that Jesus came into the world that we might have what? Life. He wants to give us abundant life while we're living and for eternity. He's all about life. He's not a death dealer. He's a life giver. And Jesus rose from the dead. And because he lives, we will rise. But now Christ is risen from the dead and has become the first fruits. That is the first taste of a great harvest to those who have fallen asleep or died. And because he promised to return, we will go with him. You know, Jesus is a promise keeper if there ever was one. He promised that he was going to rise again on the third day. And because he was able to keep that promise, then there's no other promise I can imagine that he wouldn't be able to keep. First Corinthians 15, I want to reveal to you a wonderful secret. We will not all die, but we will all be transformed. It will happen in a moment in the blink of an eye when the last trumpet is blown. For when the trumpet sounds, those who have died will be raised to live forever. And we who are living will also be transformed from Jesus' own lips, I go to prepare a place for you, and I will come again to receive you to myself, that where I am, you may be also. Well, folks, we keep gathering because unlike the fickle crowds that met Jesus coming from Bethany on Palm Sunday, who were all about getting what they want, when they wanted it, how they wanted it, in the time frame they wanted it, they wanted it, and they were crying Hosanna and hallelujah and blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And six days later they were crying, crucify him. Why? Because they didn't get what they wanted. We're not like that group. We don't want to tell God what we want. We want to accept what God wants to give. And what is it that God wants to give you? He wants to give you forgiveness of sins. He wants to wash away your sin. He wants to make you live forever. He wants, to, he wants to take away the dominion of sin in your life and the old master and the old ruler. He wants to eliminate them in your life so that you can live upright and do right and for your family and for your home and for his glory and for his kingdom. That's what he wants to do. He wants to give you eternal life. I'm just reporting today why we keep gathering we keep coming together about the cross of Christ, the empty tomb, and the promise of his coming because when Jesus rose from the dead, he broke the pattern. He proved his deity, and he guaranteed that he could keep every promise he ever made. We gather because we can't quit talking about it. We can't quit singing about it. We can't stop praising him for it, and we can never stop proclaiming the good news that he is risen. Well, I got a question for you today. There's a lot of folks here, and I know most of you. There's a lot of you that I don't know. I got a question for you. Does the resurrection of Jesus matter to you? Is this just, a, is this objective information, some historical folkloric, folkloric thing from the lore of the past that a lot of, you know, weak-minded, silly people who just are religious in nature, and they have to have a crutch in life, and they're just thinking about this Savior figure, and they just got to know, or, 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 or is this just some historical lesson, something that people used to believe? Is it objective or is it subjective? He is your Savior. You have believed in Him. You have trusted Him. And I'm telling you, I'm standing up in front of you today with no goodness of my own. But I'm standing up in front of you today that I have received the goodness of Jesus Christ because I believed I was a sinner and I believed He died for me. And I asked Him to do just what He promised He would to take away my sin, to save my soul, and to give me eternal life. And he did it, and I have the witness of the Spirit that says on the inside, no matter what I do, you are mine. And he says it all the time. I have a question. 
Have you believed? Have you received Jesus? Do you believe in the resurrection? You know, it really matters. It matters eternally. In fact, the resurrection is the fact that changes everything else. Some want to say Jesus was a great teacher. He was a great example. He set all oh, the Sermon on the Mount. Is, he, he was a, his ethics are beyond anything else, and we just need to set him up as a great teacher and, an, and a great ethological teacher, and we just need to emulate him, and all the world would be different, perhaps. But none of that makes any difference if he didn't do what he said he was going to do, which was die for our sins and then come out of that grave. It matters if you believe in the resurrection. In fact, if we were to point to a Bible verse that says that so clearly, I would have to go once again to 1 John chapter. Listen, what does the Bible say? If we confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in our heart that God has raised him from the dead, we will be saved. You hear that? If we confess with our mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in our heart, not just contemplate it in our mind, but believe it, reach for it, ask for it, receive it, believe in our heart and believe that God raised him from the dead. Can't take that out. Believe in the resurrection. We will be saved, safe, secure for all of eternity. It's the truth that validates everything else. This is so incredibly important to you. The Bible says, I don't want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope for. If we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus for this we say to you by the word of the Lord that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep or died. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, the voice of an archangel with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise. They'll rise. And we who are alive and remain shall be caught up, this is a big word here, together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, Comfort one another with these words if we believe. So it's Easter. This is a, just a wonderful, wonderful season of celebration to remember our Lord, to remember his death, of course, but also to remember his resurrection. That's what we're doing today. I'd like you to bow your head and close your eyes. I have a question for you today on this Easter morning. Have you come alive spiritually? Have you believed in the Lord Jesus? Have you called on him to be your savior? Have you? Have you said, Lord, save me? Maybe this is your first time in church. Maybe you've come for a long time. Maybe you've been a member of this church. Your name is on a roll somewhere, but you have never personally accepted the facts of the coming life, death, burial, and his resurrection. You've never said, I see it, I believe it, and I entrust everything to it. I believe Jesus died for me. And have you said, Jesus, save me? Let me put it another way. If today was your last and you found yourself passing into eternity, are you confident that you have believed in Jesus, his death, burial, and resurrection, and trusted him, calling on him, are you confident or are you not? It makes all the difference in the world. Pastor, would you pray for me today? I don't know where I would go if I died. I have never personally, individually, ask Jesus to save me by faith believing that he died for me and rose again I've never done that but I need to do that would you pray for me that I would do it heads are bowed eyes are closed I'm not going to make you give a speech or do anything I just want to pray for you if you'd say yes Pastor Phil pray for me I need that would you just raise your hand 
anywhere in the auditorium. God bless you, son. God bless you, ma'am. And God bless you, ma'am. And sir, I see your hand. God bless you. I'm looking at you. I see your hand back here. I see you back here. God bless you. Nobody else looking, please, except those that are raising their hand. Oh, I see your hand, ma'am. And I see yours, and I see yours. You see, God's talking to you. This isn't just Phil babbling up here. This is the Word of God it's being proclaimed, and the Holy Spirit is talking to you. Who else would say, I need this. I need Jesus to save me. Just put your hand up. I see your hand and your hand and your hand. Oh, my. I want to pray for you. I want to pray for you. And then after that, I want to pray with you. Heads are bowed and eyes are closed. Father, I don't know how many hands were raised this morning of people, individuals that you have spoken to through your word this morning and I thank you that you are calling them. I thank you that you are reaching out to them. Now I pray right now most of all, I pray Father by the power of your Holy Spirit that you would bind Satan please stop distractions and influences in their life today so that they can do what is necessary this morning to come alive by faith. I pray that you would help them to do that in Jesus' name. And heads are bowed and eyes are closed. And I'm just going to stand right up here and I'd like the whole congregation to stand if you would, but please don't leave. Let's just stand. I prayed for you. I want to pray with you. You, you're, you're saying, I want Jesus to save me. Then here's what do. I want you to do this. I want you to listen to what I'm saying and make it your own. And call out to God just like this. God, I know you are there and you are talking to me. Today, I know that I am a sinner at the root, and I know that there is the fruit of sin in my life. And I know that my sin separates me from you. I'm dead in my sin. I can't quit. I believe, God, that you sent your son, Jesus, into the world. And he came and lived was born of a virgin and lived 33 years and never sinned so that he could go and die for my sin. And he was put on a cross and cruelly treated and he died horribly for my sin. And today I believe it. I believe it was my sin that was involved. I believe that Jesus died for me I believe he was buried in a tomb. And I believe just like the scripture says that after three days, he rose from the dead to prove that all of his promises are true. I believe. Today, I ask, admitting my sin and repenting with the intention of not letting sin rule me, Today, I ask you, Jesus, save me from my sin. Save me. I trust you. And I thank you for dying for me. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. Amen. Remain standing. In just a minute, I'm going to let everybody leave. But here's what I would like to do. Those people who honestly and sincerely, I'm not going to make you make a speech or do anything, but if you honestly called on Jesus and you said, Jesus, save me. Well, we believe God does what he says he's going to do. We believe he saved you. But we would like to know to rejoice and just write your name down so we can pray for you. I want you to come down and shake my hand. That's all I want you to do. Just come right down here. And shake my hand and say, today, I ask Jesus 
to save me. That's all I want you to do. I want to read something to you. I, I thought about singing this. <laughs> but I, I better not break out singing. It's my second sermon. I probably, my voice would crack. I just want you to know this isn't the last gathering. And even all of these gatherings we have here on earth, they really don't compare to a gathering that's coming. <laughs> this old song says it so well. There's going to be a meeting in the air in the sweet, sweet by and by, and I am going to meet you there, meet you in that home beyond the sky. Such singing you will hear, never heard by mortal ear, twill be glorious, I do declare. And God's own son will be the leading one at the meeting in the air. And there's going to be a meeting one day because the trumpet's going to blow and we're all going together to be in his presence no more ability to sin, all gone, and will be in his presence forever in glory and in service and in love and in praise. And it'll be worth it all.